um, and we'll get to we'll get to know each other um, better uh, throughout the workshop too. So. Uh, First, I just wanna welcome um, all the vaccine equity learning community members uh, to this workshop. Um, this is the first training workshop on planning a successful community-led vaccine event. Uh, I'm Bridget Corteau. I'm the director of group learning for the Partnering for Vaccine Equity Learning Community and be on behalf of our team at the Urban Institute. Uh, thanks again for joining us this afternoon. Uh, before we get uh, into the work that we are here to do, I did want to take a minute to acknowledge just how painful the past couple of days have been um, for our country, for our communities, for our families. Uh, I imagine that many of you, like me, have vacillated between um, feelings of heartbreak and anger, uh, hopelessness, sometimes helplessness, um, and figuring out how to take care of ourselves and the people that depend on us at home and at work. Uh, can be overwhelming um, while also coping with a steady, what feels like a steady onslaught of tragedy um, and injustice across the country and internationally. So I personally feel fortunate uh, to spend many of my working hours on this project, on the Partnering for Vaccine Equity project, where I um, and my excellent team uh, at Urban um, and across the many different partners uh, supporting the learning community and the PAVE work uh, can uh, prop up um, and help enhance the critical work that all of you are doing um, and many of your peers who aren't here in this workshop, uh, the work that you're doing to build up your communities, to address the inequities um, that are embedded across all types of systems and institutions uh, and to get life-changing um, and life-saving uh, resources to where they're needed. So today's session um, is focused just on that. Uh, you'll get advice from and begin working with a team of excellent facilitators uh, and each other to start planning vaccine events that are truly community led and community responsive. So I'm going to introduce our facilitators in just a minute, but before I do that, I do want to cover some uh, housekeeping issues. We are recording the session. You probably heard that when we flipped the recording on. Uh, so that we can share the content with the broader learning community. We do plan to edit the video so that it includes just the presentation portions, the slide portions, um, and the spoken portion that goes along with them uh, as part of the video. So we aren't going to include Q&A discussion or anything that happens in the breakout rooms um, as part of this video recording. And like I just mentioned, um, we do have a couple of breakout sessions today. When it comes time for those, we'll let you know how to get to the right place um, and how to record the key points that come out of your breakout sessions uh, so they can be reported back to the group. And finally, uh, we do have a very full agenda and lots of fantastic information to cover. There won't be specific breaks for questions and answers. Um, so I encourage you to put your questions for facilitators or for each other into the chat. Um, I'll be collecting them, and I expect that speakers may get to many of them at some point in their, in their remarks, um, but questions that we don't have time to answer will be compiled and circulated to participants after the session, um, along with session materials, uh, and the facilitator team is going to stay on this Zoom for 15 minutes after the session officially ends to answer any questions you might have about planning a vaccine event in your community. So if you're able to stay and have questions you want to pose that way, um, we welcome you to do that. Uh, so also, if you have technical difficulties at any point during the session, send an email to our community manager's inbox. I'll chat that in just a second, but it's vaxequitylearning at urban.org. I'm going to be keeping an eye on that, um, and I'll try to help you as quickly as I can. And now, um, without any further uh, delays, it's my pleasure to introduce our three workshop facilitators. Uh, Lisa Cruz is the executive director of the newly formed Mont Multicultural Coalition, Inc., uh, formed in October 2020, based on a movement created to acknowledge racial biases and pro proactively reach communities of color with meaningful communication and actionable services, removing barriers, elevating all voices, and fostering community engagement in Winnebago, Outagamie, and Calumet counties in Wisconsin. Uh, Patricia, or Trish Sarvella, uh, is the Chief Development Officer at Partnership Community Health Center in Appleton, Wisconsin. Uh, from her time as a Peace Corps volunteer in Honduras to her 20 plus years of work at community health centers, uh, Trish has dedicated her entire professional career to improving the well being of underserved and vulnerable populations. And Dr. Pam is the CEO and owner of 4G Business Solutions and a consultant, trainer, and thought leader to several corporations, government agencies, and nonprofits in the areas of cultural competency, 
equity, diversion, and inclusion, uh, strategic planning, and organizational leadership and development. And uh, Dr. Pam is also currently the vice president of Multicultural Coalition, which I know we're going to hear um, about in a minute when we start the slide. So uh, thank you so much, Lisa, Trish, Dr. Pam, for joining us today. Um, I'm really looking forward to what you're going to share with the group. Great. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Trish, and um, we are thrilled to be here and kicking off this first part of a two-part series that we'll be doing with the group. Um, I do love the front slide that was there because it shows a plane that's really intact. And what we've been saying since the beginning of this, and many of you, I'm sure, in your communities and around the country have used that phrase of, we're building the plane while we're flying it, as we're trying to figure out and navigate how to um, live within a public health emergency and how to mobilize our communities. But we've reached a place where we are really getting ready to take off. And um, this afternoon will really all be about understanding some of the work we've been doing around community-led vaccinations, engaging community, and really um, finding ways to be impactful and make a difference. So um, we were thrilled to get the feedback from everyone around the um, vaccine clinics that you might have done in your community and some of the questions that you had, how best to reach rural populations, how to engage in vaccine efforts, um, find vaccinators and all of those things. So hopefully we'll be able to answer your questions throughout this. But for those of you who are not familiar with um, Wisconsin, I noticed that there are a couple of Midwesterners on the call and we're also joined by our new health director. Um, Appleton is part of the Fox Cities area. We're in Northeast Wisconsin. And for those of you who are Packer fans, we're just a little bit south of Green Bay. For those of you who are Magic fans, we are also home to Harry Houdini and the Houdini Museum. But most importantly, we are home to a growing and diverse community of people who came to this area based on the river to build factories and paper. But today, really people who have come to build their community, build their families and work together around equity. Um, as we look at the challenges that our community faced pre-pandemic, we recently got our new census data that showed that there was a huge increase in diverse populations coming to an area that traditionally had not been so diverse. And as we look at the data, we really find that this gives us a roadmap in where we want to go in the communities that we'd like to, to embrace. So I'd like to turn back time a little bit to everyone's kind of frame of reference when the pandemic began, began March of 2020, when we were hit with the, you must shelter at home and how are we going to do this and masking and watching the TV. And, and it, it's fairly traumatizing to go back to those moments to think about where we were in a bit of paralysis of what to do and how to respond. One of the things that our community is um, very experienced in and very proud of is that we come together. We come together with solutions that focus on problems that are in front of us. And the pandemic was very similar to that. In the past, we looked at infant mortality or tobacco control or other issues, but they were still very surface because they didn't hit everyone. The pandemic hit everyone. So when we came together as what we called the community solutions team, we recognized that we needed to address emerging need and very urgent community need. There was a bit of, well, panic, but also a bit of strategy and a lot of commitment to say, what can we do as a community to meet the needs of our most vulnerable populations? And at that time, in the beginning, it was really the elderly or people who were at home or people with kids. What were we going to do with food? How are we going to address transportation issues if people needed to get to the pharmacy to get their medication? What about health care? What about people losing their jobs? How are we going to really begin to bring this together? So we had a marching order. We're in it together, stronger than ever, and everyone comes up with these sort of battle cries. But we were very committed to this work, and our Community United Way brought a group together, hospitals, public health, hunger relief, many different nonprofits, the ecumenical community, our transportation resources, ourselves as a federally qualified community health center, different governments and counties to really begin to address what are the needs going to be in this new world that we're living in. As the result of our work began, we knew we needed to figure out strategies for pharmacy, particularly getting that to people figuring out what transportation resources were still in place. Could you still ride the bus? How was that gonna impact people? 
knowing that many people in our community were immediately losing their jobs. And if they were losing their jobs, what were they doing without health insurance? How were we gonna mitigate that? How are we gonna move people together so we could really begin to address these issues? Well, as a community, we have a wealth of info. We have spreadsheets, we have data banks, we have people, we work with 211, we had a hub that was give help, get help. But what we recognized, and this was not a new piece for us to recognize, but was highly illuminated within the beginning of the pandemic is that the communication out to the people who needed it the most, the people who were disproportionately affected and impacted by COVID were our communities of color, our non-English speaking populations, people in rural areas, and how were we really going to get that information out to them? Because we were doing it as sort of business as usual. We knew how to get info out there and how to mobilize, but we didn't know how to get deeper into the community as a collective. At that same time, many things were bubbling up with civil unrest in our own country, with Asian hate and the murder and many other things that were happening. And how then do we begin to look at equitable food systems and equitable prevention and information out to people without changing things up, without shaking the system and saying, wow, we have a portion of our community who is now connected to this stuff, but those who need it most are not. So as our community access team looked at these issues, there was a moment where we knew that we really needed to expand and connect and mobilize with our communities of color. And at that beginning, it was, wow, could we just get something translated? And knowing that the depth of the people on this call know that it is so much more than a flyer or putting it in the language or even looking at the health literacy, we needed to figure out a way to move forward and engage and connect with people where they were at, at the grassroots level to impact not only from the prevention standpoint, the mitigation of COVID, but then getting resources to those people who need it the most and wait for vaccination. This was all pre, we were on the cusp of what was going to happen next. We really believe that during this time, and I think many people felt this way, with crisis comes opportunity. There's no time like the present. You can plan and work plan and have a strategy, but until it needs to get put into action with urgency and competency, like what happened in March 2020, that's when we really needed to act. And that at the genesis was the beginning of the Multicultural Coalition, really as we came together, not only just to make sure we had equitable communication, because that was really our beginning point, but that we were able to address the needs of our most vulnerable populations. But in order to address needs, we need to build trust. We need to build community. We need to find ways to look at these inequities, not with my lens of how I saw an inequity, but with the lens of the people who were living this and going back to the grassroots to understand that those closest to the problem are those closest to the solution. When I reflect on this picture, this was the first time that we brought our diverse communities together with our secretary elect, Karen Timberlake at the state level to really identify what the challenges were and what was needed. It wasn't like we just needed a grant. We just need funds. No, we needed a change. We needed revolution in a lot of ways to really shake this up so we could not just feel like we were doing the right thing, but that we were doing this in conjunction and in with a compassionate eye, but with a new way of really beginning to address the challenges in our community as it's related to COVID. Thank you, Trish. And I, I will hop in and just I want to reiterate how important it is for this group on today's call to understand how we came to be, because we set the foundation for the work that we were going to continue to do into the future. So when we talk about with crisis comes an opportunity, I will tell you personally, I was challenged in terms of facing the pandemic, running a small business, children, um, a husband on the front lines. And personally, I was, I was challenged and I thought, I want to be able to do something. And um, Trish used one of my favorite words, revolution. That's how I felt at the time when Trish and others in the community came and said, we need to do a better job of reaching our communities of color. So for those um, who are not familiar with my background, I also do quite a bit in crisis management. So this is, every which way you looked at it, was a crisis. So 
we started to take a look around at our community. I have lived in this community for more than 20 years, understand it intimately, both as an outsider and as a person who belongs in the community. So one of the things that we knew going into this work, and we didn't know that we were gonna fast forward to vaccination clinics, but at this time we knew we needed to build trust. This was critically important to set the table with trust. And if you're um, in a small town community like we are with a number of communities around, there's uh, vulnerable populations, communities of color, we knew we had to start at a place that we had to make the assumption there is no trust. There is no trust between public health and communities of color. There is no trust with the general population. So how can we start to build trust? So one of the first things we did, and again, this is after researching what other um, highly populated metro areas were doing. And I took a look at what others were doing. And I thought this, this won't work in our community. So one of the first things we did is look at those community leaders from the communities of color and pull them and ask them to be a part of our virtual table. And then from there, we looked at all the public health entities. They were invited to be at this table. We looked at other nonprofits. They were invited to be at this virtual table. And again, to set, to set the stage, you know how this world has been operating at a virtual level. So we actually began meeting way back early in the pandemic, and it was about building trust. And I can't say that enough. And in order to build trust, you need to be vulnerable. You need, I always say you need to check your ego and you need to bring your heart. So that's what we were doing around our virtual table, bringing people together to get to know one another and to build relationships. We didn't know at the time, when you talk about building the plane as you're flying it, we didn't know at the time where we were going, but we knew we needed to do better. And a first place to start was communications. So there are so many barriers we're gonna talk about in identification of barriers when it comes to communications that were existing in our communities and we needed to do it better. And in order to do it better, we need to be better as human beings. And we need to look at this from those people we were trying to serve, our most vulnerable populations. So again, we talk about the multicultural coalition. So really a community-based organization with at any given point, I think we've had meetings where there's been 50 people sitting around the virtual table, there's been 100 people sitting around the virtual table, but the goal was to create a safe space and to build trust, and I cannot say that enough. Sorry, I have to flip my own slides here so it gets a little goofy. So when we talk about the multicultural coalition today, we still have so many partners sitting around the table with us today in the work that we're doing. So we started out as a communications committee really focused on how can we do communications better and how can we build trust between all the community members that are represented around our table. And one thing I really want to make sure that is very apparent this is not about me sitting at the table or others sitting at the table talking and saying what needs to be done. This is about communication, and that means that's a two-way street. It's about listening to what our most vulnerable populations are saying, and then figuring out a course of action with all of us together. This is really, really important, and I have no doubt that many of you, all of you on this phone call understand that, but we're not talking about a top-down approach. We are talking from grassroots on up, and in order to do that, again, it's check your ego, bring your heart, and open your ears to listen to what is being said, and again, we've been, we were meeting every, it was like once a week in the beginning, and it made checking your pride, being humble and listening to the areas that needed to be improved in our community so we could do better and be better as human beings. So today, you'll see this slide right now. It represents what I lovingly call um, our dream team. And so the Multicultural Coalition, we have since um, become an incorporation. We are currently working on filing for our 501c3. 
But these are all board members. We have Ola Demichi Tamori from Pointers Community Initiative. We have Trish from Partnership. We have Ernie from Casa Espana. We have Dr. Pam from New Mug Professionals, all represented around the table and so many other grassroots organizations. Because again, this is grassroots going up, not a top-down approach. So one of the things we talked about and you have heard, and I witnessed, and I can't believe I lived as how I have for the first 50 years of my life. The pandemic exposed so many cracks in the system, the cracks in the community. And I really started to look at what needed to be done. And oh my gosh, the underserved communities weren't, be, weren't being served, especially at this critical time. And I tell you all of this because this is part of my process and part of the committee's process of moving through all the barriers and discovery process and the listening sessions that took place and the vulnerable conversations that took place for us to get at, at the table together equitably to figure out then what were the solutions that needed to happen as we moved forward. So again, you all know this. But what we found is critically important, as I mentioned, we have to build trust. And how are we going to build trust? And that means we're listening, we're being vulnerable, we're checking our ego, bringing our heart. Because if I took a look around and I took a lot of looks around what was happening with the lack of trust, and a lot of that I attribute to the lack of communication. So this brings back my communication background if nobody's communicating, those voids are filled with misinformation, which then leads to fear, denial, hospitalizations, death, trauma. The impact is lasting for generations. How can we build trust as a community? And a lot of it was showing up and listening and then taking action, which was critically important for our community. As I said, and I wanna make sure, <laughs> trust is everything to this work that we're doing. So one of the things we talked about is that identification of barriers. And this was critically important. And this kept coming up over and over the barriers that were in place within our own community. And then how can we do what we say and say what we mean, so to speak, and take action. So I'm just going to give an example. One of the very first barriers during um, high influx of testing needed that needed to be done in our community, we heard from communities of color repre represented around our table that IDs were gonna be checked at testing locations. Whether or not that was um, a fact or not, that was the perception out there, then that was curbing people from showing up for vaccinations. So that's just one example I'm sure you're all very familiar with, but if you take yourself back two years ago, over two years ago, this was a huge barrier to overcome. Yeah, we talked about this is a grassroots up endeavor, not a top down approach. So anytime I think I'm in a space of saying, here's what, what's going to be done, I sit back and I check myself and I listen. I listen to what others are saying around that table who are deep in the trenches of the work that at finding a solution with us. So going back to those weekly and then um, bi-weekly meetings we were doing with the committee, again, this is so important because we don't wanna just have groups leap into hosting a vaccination clinic or a community event. This building of the trust was hugely important for us in the Fox Cities area. So we had many conversations that were so incredibly uncomfortable but together we talked through them and we keep talk, talking through them. We acknowledge as a, as a committee systemic racism. So many times people were vulnerable sharing their stories. We were honest with one another. And again, it goes back to creating that safe space because I think what many of us have witnessed is the breakdown of people talking. I see this all the time between a white person and a person of color and they don't even know how to talk anymore. When that communication breaks down, that trust breaks down and there's nothing to build from. So again, really, really important. And one of the other things that was so important, and Dr. Pam, I always think about you, 
is we are tired of talking, we need action. Those were our words of inspiration. Again, this came up at the committee level over and over again. How many times are we gonna keep talking before we get to the action point? So again, keep in mind where we were in the space of this virtual meeting with the committee and we got to that point as a community, it is time to take action. So this goes to Dr. Pam and Long Vu from New Monk Professionals. Again, some moments are just like clear as day in my mind. When I heard Long Vu from one of our many committee members around the table said, we want our own vaccination space. We want our own place where we can get vaccination safely. We see other people of color on site. And we have interpreters, we want it in a location where the people are, this is critically, critically important. And within two weeks, we kicked off our first community led vaccination clinic. And that was absolutely crazy. Now looking back, but maybe not so crazy. Because if you think about it, we had a year's worth of work leading up to this point of time. And we were able to execute on this first community led vaccination clinic in two weeks because we had spent the time to build the trust. We had spent the time to have vulnerable conversations with one another. We had spent the time to ask questions of one another and then to listen. So again, this is just going over everything that I've talked through in terms of all those committee meetings that we have been doing for um, weeks on end. And all, you know, I talk about the committee that we formed. But it was also going back to the relationships that we were building with one another. And so sometimes, a lot of times, these conversations were not happening at the committee level, but they were also happening now on our own time. We were starting to build relationships with the greater communities that we were trying to serve. So together, as we've talked about, we worked through a list of readiness to get to that place in time. Um, identification of barriers. I talked about the trust barrier removals. And I'll tell you, we got a lot of um, pushback, but we continue to talk through the solutions with other partners without throughout our region. And then, but also understanding, really understanding who those community partners were, the resources that we were able to tap into. And then again, going back to the communities, communities we are serving and looking through the world from their eyes. I'm just gonna skip ahead. Um, so this just goes back to when we talk about that committee level and who was seated around the table. So I just kind of broke this out. Everything that I've said, and four easy steps. Facilitate that ongoing listening and sharing sessions, critically important. If you've already been having vaccination events, and I think many of you have been, and you haven't been doing this part, it is not too late to start. Create that safe space to have those vulnerable, tough discussions where people feel uncomfortable. Let listening be the driver for impact. And then take the approach that this is more than just a jab, and I know that's kind of a UK term, more than just a shot, more than just a vaccination. And we're gonna get more um, deeper into that conversation as well today. So this gives you an example of our very first event, going back to, I think it was 13, 14 months ago, we decided once Long Vu said, we want our own vaccination event, we went and, and listened to where that event should take place. It was at Longchang, or I'm sorry, Longchang Marketplace um, within the city of Appleton. So we went to where people are. And then we looked closely at the communications. So there is another point I really wanna make sure that I get across in this presentation today. Do not think if you post an event on social media, your job is done. In fact, your job is just beginning. One critically important piece when we talk about communications and outreach is delivering the communications where people are, what they are using, and figuring out what are the barriers in place. 
So just a couple of weeks ago, we were out on the road in rural Calumet County delivering flyers, translated flyers in person. Look at your community leaders to help deliver the message in languages that are comfortable for people to receive the message. And look at your messaging, and there's so much more, but that was so critically important to this first event and now subsequently the, the 50 plus other events that we've had. We are constantly also looking at the barrier removals of the events that we're hosting as well as leading up to the events themselves. So when there is um, when there are barriers in place, that leads to mistrust. And just anecdotally, at this first event, um, I think we were. I hate to give numbers, but I will tell you that we um, had over a hundred people attend this first event. And if you understand the size of our communities that we're serving, this was astronomical and so needed for our Hmong community. So I think that leads to our first breakout session because we wanna make sure that you all have time to talk through in smaller discussions, discussion groups about who you are serving or who you intend to serve. And this is really, really important. Everybody, it's, it's very common for people to say, we're, we're here to serve everybody. But I'll tell you, we know going into our community-led vaccination events that we will, we will talk about reaching out to the Hmong community. We welcome everybody, don't get me wrong, but we're very intentful about our outreach efforts. So really talk through who is it you're trying to serve. And then are there leaders or representatives of the communities that you're trying to serve that you could also bring to the table to help engage and start building trust? Are there also organizations and resources who should be at the table? along with you. And again, I understand many of you are already, the train has left the station when it comes to hosting these events, but this is also meant to be, if, if you haven't planned one, here's the building blocks that we use. And if you are in the midst of hosting events, maybe an opportunity to take a step back and look at what you've been doing and maybe where you've been missing a few opportunities. And then think about identifying that comfortable, safe space to listen and begin trust building. I tell you again, I speak from my personal journey and story. It's so easy to slip into here's how things need to be done and then turn that dial down and sit back and listen to the people that you are serving and what needs to be done. And it is literally transformational when you look at the world through another's perspective. So I think we have about 10 minutes, Mary, is that correct or Bridget? Yes, we're gonna do 10 minutes. So go ahead and take 10 minutes with your groups and I think you will be put into rooms. All right, I just opened up the breakout rooms and a little box should have popped up on your screen and you just need to accept that and you'll be moved into one of the rooms. And I'm going to put a Google Doc in the chat that you all can use in your breakout rooms. Mary, <clears throat> I think we still have some people in the, the main room. Not sure if they were able to go into the other rooms. Okay. Let's see if we can get them to join. I'm showing one person has not joined yet. So Cassandra, if you're still with us, um, we'd love for you to go into a breakout room.
I got to remember to turn the slides for this next session too. <laughs> It's harder to turn slides for myself. Are we in our own breakout room right now? Hi, and welcome back. I think we might have some people who are still talking because this is a great topic to engage in, but we're gonna get started because we wanna make sure that we do some more sharing with you. I just wanna kind of share, you know, set the tone for why we're doing breakout sessions. Part of this piece of today's session is to give you our experience and how we organize in the foundational pieces that we embarked on to be able to build up to the sessions or to the, the events, the vaccination events. But the other piece of this is also to allow you an opportunity to put together an action plan. So you can walk away today with something tangible that you can start to build on, right? And so that's why we're doing the breakout session. So I encourage you to do that. The other thing is there's a Google Doc that's posted in your breakout session. When you go into that, we would like you to put your thoughts and ideas into that Google Doc because we're going to share that with the rest of the groups. Because we have you into groups, you can't meet everybody. We wanna share some of the thoughts and ideas and concepts around some of the things you talked about in that Google Doc with everybody um, in the session itself. So next breakout session, we're gonna have you uh, ensure that you go into that Google Doc to share some of the things that you guys talk about. Okay, Lisa, next. So I know Lisa and Trish have talked about this as well too, um, but when we look at the actual planning piece, so we did the 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 um, trust building piece, and that was really important. But then we now are in the planning, right? How do we put everything together, and how do we do this? And so. In any situation, you have two challenges or you have two options. You either can look at it as a crisis or an opportunity. And depending on how you determine that, that's how you proceed. And for us, it was not so much of we can't do that or we can't do this or that won't work because those are the pieces that a lot of people were telling us. But we said this is an opportunity. And so we asked ourselves, how could we do that? How can we make it possible? And if there was a barrier or an obstacle, we talked about how can we go over it, under it, around it, and who do we need to help us to be able to do this? So that's really critical is your whole mindset when you're going into this has to be at the right level. And when it's at the right level, you'll encounter challenges, but you'll look at them as opportunities to grow and to um, engage your communities even more deeply. Next. The other component of this, and we talked about the trust building and all the things that we were doing to do the trust building. But the one thing that we also realized is that we can get our communities of color ready. And as a community advocate in this community for 20 plus years, I also was instrumental in creating the very first EDI um, coordinated position for the city of Appleton, which is unheard of at the time in 1997. Um, no one in the state of Wisconsin had an EDI coordinator at the government city level. And so part of the work that I was doing is really not only to go into the communities of color to say, hey, you know, what are your needs and how can we help you? But we also, the organizations and the community itself had to be ready. When we received those answers, when we did those listening sessions and we heard from the communities, that we were looking at helping and elevating when they share things with us, we had to be able to act on that. So one of the pieces that we felt was really critical was the whole cultural competency piece. And as you look at these components of how critical that piece is, you have the vaccination, which is kind of what we were hoping to do is to engage people to get people vaccinated. And then you have the community engagement piece and the resources, and that was the partnering and uh, the organizations and bringing all of them um, together. So MCI was the vaccination piece um, with arranging for that. And then in the middle is the human experience. And the human experience is about building trust and then also transferring trust. And you can't you know, really build something that's sustainable without all these two components and then actually creating a human experience that really speaks to trust and not only building trust, but being able to transfer that trust to other organizations. And in order to be able to transfer trust, you have to have the organizations ready. And what does that mean to have organizations ready? And what is cultural competency? Next slide. So cultural competency is really first understanding ourselves 
as an individual, as an organization, before we can truly understand others. Because we need to realize that within ourselves, there are privileges, implicit unconscious biases, and microaggressions that we commit each and every day with even, without even being aware of that, right? So in this cycle, I wanna share with you that these are the things that we talked about within our group, about how do we help them recognize the difference between intent and impact. There's a big difference between intent and impact. You know, we always have the intent to get up every morning to help everybody, but how we help them in the lens in which we use to make those decisions creates the impact. And that is the piece that we were lacking. So that means we have to go on this journey of cultural competency, deconstructing these privileges, implicit unconscious biases and microaggressions. And through that piece, be able to shift our lenses to co-create these um, safe spaces right, through our, our personal storytelling and their personal storytelling and all those different pieces. And then we have to align that journey with the organizational journey because people run organizations. Organizations are not run by buildings, okay, or, or you know, entities. They're run by people. So how do we align that? And then how does that impact the EDI commitment that we have? And so cultural competency is the journey. EDI is the application of that journey. And then through that piece, we truly can create a sustainable culture of inclusion and um, help people to see what we're doing and then also to meet them at where they're at. Not where we think they're at, where we want them to be at, but to really be there for them at where they're at. And then through that piece, to be able to engage in impactful change and action. So cultural competency is not about others. Cultural competency starts with each one of us. And that was something really important we had to share with our partners. Next slide. So community-led vaccination clinic through cultural competency. What does that look like? It's a very intentional journey. Next slide. It has to do with identifying barriers, which is what Lisa and Trish talked about. It's about understanding your target audience. You are not serving everybody. And if you think you're going to be able to serve everybody, you're just really opening yourselves up for more challenges. You have to be very um, certain about who you are serving. Now, with that said, it doesn't mean that the community can't come, the public can't come. Our events are open up to everyone in the community. But when we target a certain audience, we really look at the location. We look at you know, the safety, all of those different pieces. Then we're very intentional about which vaccinators we bring in. Who do we partner with that can create that experience that we are going for? And then we're also committed to ongoing planning meetings. So it's not just we talk today and hopefully we'll be able to do it in a couple of weeks. Every day of that week, we meet for uh, five, 10 minutes. We schedule, there's a cadence to that for an event so that we're meeting every you know, couple of days, every week. And then as it goes up to the, the event day, we're meeting even more often than that. We also meet, need to make sure that the event itself is identified or built up a, around an identified need. So when we talk about events, we're not just talking about um, a shot in the arm, we're talking about a community event. So within that context, we are also trying to figure out the needs of the, the communities that are coming to us. So for example, we have community members that, that um, indicated that they had no snow boots for their children, no snow pants. They needed hygiene products and all of that. We made sure that we had those things to give to them when they came. So it was more than just a shot in the arm. And then we need to make, we also need to um, be able to do outreach through the host organizations, which are the partners, the culturally based organizations. We allow them to do the outreach because they are trusted within their community and people know who they are and they can get people there because of trust that they've already established. So that's what it means to be intentional. Next slide. So what are some of the barriers? Next slide. One of the barriers that very early on that we, we encountered was pre-registration. And I said to the group, I said, the, the communities, the audience that we are working with, that we are striving to um, have conversation with and to listen to, they are not a P RSVP community. They don't RSVP for things, okay? If they trust you, if there's a relationship, they just show up. And when they show up, they just expect that you're going to be there to support them and help them. And that's fine. So we had no pre-registration required. We knew that there were undocumented families and individuals and they would be concerned about IDs. So we made sure that they knew that there was no IDs required. We did not ask for health insurance. 
and we took the bare minimum information that we needed to put into the electronic health system. Okay, next one. Go ahead, Lisa. I, I want to make sure that um, I talk through some of the barriers that we continue to experience from our perspective as community organizers. And I know some of you also mentioned this in some of the feedback in the pre-event survey. I can't even tell you how many times I've, I've run into jurisdictional boundaries and barriers to the organizing that we're trying to do. Um, I have a better understanding of it today, but that continues to be um, a barrier, perhaps um, one entity not communicating with another because there's those jurisdictional boundaries. Um, finding vaccinators, I can't even tell you what a barrier this has been for the last year and a half. I um, was just talking to Trish momentarily before this meeting, talking about our challenge finding vaccinators and vaccinators who understand how this experience should shape up to be through the lens of cultural competency. Partners overall, partners come in a variety of shapes and sizes, but trying to work with organizations across the board. There have been some organizations that we have decided, no thanks, this isn't, this isn't what we're trying to do. Um, based on the communities we're serving, this is how it needs to be done based on those listening sessions. So continuously running into barriers. Now, having said that, to date, we have partnered with over 65 organizations throughout our region. So we continue to make um, movement in that area. Burnout, when I talk about organizing barriers, burnout is huge with public health departments, with us as a team going through the, um, all of the work that we have on hand with the nursing profession, the medical profession, Everyone is facing massive amounts of burnout and because we also have a worker shortage and people are retiring early. So I wanted to make sure that um, I listed that because I think that that is true and real and we encounter it. Some of the barriers we have, um, generally speaking, people. Um, personally speaking, I've run into a ton of barriers um, when it comes to perhaps having the right people on site with us finding volunteers, I mean, you name it. It just people in general have a ton going on. And there's some, a lot of times it's like pushing a, a boulder up hill is like what I try to say. Um, and then logistically, this has been a huge barrier for us. I can't even tell you the, um, we have all these materials that we use for our clinics. Um, where to store all the materials, how to transport all the materials. So there are a number of barriers that have been placed, but I will tell you that we continue to burst through these barriers by being creative and not, not taking no for an answer. Thank you, Lisa. So the other barrier that we encountered was transportation. And I think a lot of times when we think about transportation, it's people having a car to get somewhere, but transportation is so much more than that. It is not just about having a vehicle, but the location that we have, is it a safe location? Can they get there? Do they know where that is? And can they get there? Is there parking? Is there lighting? Um, our very first uh, clinic that we had or, or community event that we had was in the midst of the Asian hate piece. And because of safety issues, we held it at a, a um, facility where the Asian community was comfortable coming to that facility. And we also involved the police department and they knew that we were doing that. And so they drove by and they stopped in and said hello to the Asian communities that were coming out to get vaccinated and all of that. So when you think about transportation, go beyond just, oh, getting people there, but you got to think about all the other pieces of how do you co-create that safe space with them where they feel comfortable coming to you. And then the other piece is working with public trans, uh, transportation, public transit, and working through those pieces for them so that they can create something to help you get people there. Next slide. You speak my language. This is really important. I want you to keep in mind that as we were doing these clinics, we wanted people to come there and see people that look like them, people who could speak their language. 
So we had interpreters there, we had coordinators there that were Hmong, were Hispanic, um, could speak the language, understand that. But even more critically, we had healthcare providers that were Spanish speaking, Hmong speaking, that came there. We had pharmacists, registered nurses, we had doctors in our communities that came there to answer questions. Because the, the purpose of this event was not to say, you have to come in and we're gonna give you a shot, whether you like it or not. It was come so we can answer your question. If there's anything that you need, any uh, misrepresentation that's happening that you're confused about, we're going to answer your, your questions and then you make the right decision for yourself and your family. So that was really important. Next. The other piece was really, how do we message this? How do we get information out to people? It's important to share with them. We don't make the assumption that everybody understands that we're going to not require this, not require that. We put it into our flyers and we put that out to everyone so that everyone is on the same page. And we also make sure that our vaccinators and our partners know that as well too, that we are not going to have those barriers um, that, uh, that have to be addressed at this event. We're, we're, it's a no barrier type of event. So messaging and doing it up front with the audience that you are um, working with to, to show that commitment of this is what we're saying and this is what we're going to do is really critical. So there's nothing left to, well, they're saying that, but I didn't see it in writing anywhere, right? Those are the things you have to overcome to build that trust. Next. It's so important, written language and how we put together our flyers and all of that was really important. That's why we have a review and translation committee. One of the things we have to think about in that is the literacy level of the audience that you are working with, that you're trying to outreach to. What is their literacy level? And how do we use terminology that they understand? That's really important. And how do we be short and to the point without having them read a novel before they come in? The other thing and the other pushback we got, even from the communities, of color was, why do you have to translate everything? Not, not everybody speaks Hmong. Not everybody see, or is li literate in Hmong or literate in Spanish. And what we say to them is we do that to promote that because we also know the literacy piece is also another piece that we are very in tune with is that people who are able to learn and become literate in their native language, it's easier for them to learn another language. And so part of what we want to do is to really promote that literacy piece as well too. That's another piece of equity and inequity that exists within our community. So that was really important to us. And it was how we put everything together. Next slide. So communication channels, how were we going to get this information out to them? We looked at technology, access and education. We looked at social media. Um, we looked at mass media pieces and all of those things. And so what we found was that we needed to put important and critical community leaders on, on the front line to, to be interviewed, to share this information, to, to be the person that says, it's okay to come, you will be safe. That was really important. But when we talk about communication channels, the most, um, I think the most successful and effective was the word of mouth. Once someone came and they had a great experience, they shared it with other people and those individuals came. And so they became our outreach, our communication channels. And so the trust piece really paid off with that communication. But those are things that you need to think about. How are you presenting it? Who's presenting it? And, and you know, um, to what community are they presenting it to? Next slide. Images are really important. If you are if you are looking at a community of color that you're working with, your images have to represent that those communities of color because they want to see people like them to be able to identify that piece, and then also not only put it on flyers but have people like that at the event, right? So we know that there's a lot of different pieces of barriers with visual seeing someone that looks like me, visual in terms of what we actually put on a flyer. Um, and all the other barriers that people have in terms of being able to overcome, is this really for me? Do I really belong? Should I really do this? And so we wanted to make sure that all those visual barriers were addressed. In some of our flyers, we use more photos and pictures than we did words um, because that was very powerful to them. And that's what they, they uh, understood looking at those visuals. Next. Electronic health records are, was a tremendous barrier to us because our whole 
process is not just about quantity of people coming in, but the quality of that experience and making that a positive experience. So electronic rec health records are very cumbersome. They, they require you to you know, um, get a lot of information and fill things out and all of that. So we are very intentional about who we partnered with and how much of electronic health records processing they were going to do on site versus outside of that or uh, behind the scenes. That was really important to us. So that is one of the things that I want to leave with you is how does that work and how does that, you know, understand what that process looks like with your vaccinators and people providing vaccines and, and all of that. So that was a barrier. Next. So, you know, we were thinking of um, doing another breakout session, but with the limited time that we have right now, we're probably not going to do that. I, one of the things that we wanted to leave you with is that when you go back into your respective organizations, write down these questions. Lisa, can you go back to that breakout session, please? What are the barriers that exist for your communities? Go and do a brainstorming session and bring in the right people to sit down at that table with you and talk about the barriers. And what does that look like? What are those barriers? And how can you overcome those barriers? And then you know, take a process and break it down and break it down and say, hey, how do we get people, how do we get information out? What does that look like? How, when they get there, what kind of um, experience do we want them to have? And break down that experience from every station, from the moment they walk in, the greeting, the greeters that are at the door greeting them, who should they be? What should they say? When they get to the table, what kind of paperwork should they be filling out? Who is there to help them? All of those pieces, are really critical and it's important for you to to get the lens of that process to, from the culturally informed individuals that can tell you things that you've never thought of in terms of if you do it this way people may get offended before they even walk in and you never thought of that right because we're always in a place of intent so please take this breakout session these questions and work with your organization to figure these pieces out and then next so a lot of times we get the question of how many people have been vaccinated? How many people have you vaccinated? And really it's not about the quantity, but the quality of the experience. We are about relationship building and that's why we are doing what we're doing. It's not just about COVID vaccination right now. We are looking at engaging with this community because someday we will come back to them or every day we are interacting with them on uh, at different levels on different topics. So this is all about community building and not waiting for a crisis to happen before we come together and say, what do we do? But to have this sustainable. And this is something that was, is going to apply to many facets of our community, many challenges, many inequities in our community. So with that, Trish. Absolutely, next slide please. Thank you, Dr. Pam and Lisa. And I think um, when we talk about that impact that we're having on this, and then that question that whether it's a monthly report back to HRSA or to our county government about how many, what were those numbers? What ended up happening? Um, we look at this, certainly we wanna find out how many people came. Was it a first dose? Was it their booster? Um, where did they come from? How did they hear about us? But most importantly, we ask ourselves how many lives have been impacted? And we've taken on the phrase that this vaccine is about impacting generations to come. We've also worked on the idea, and as you've heard throughout the afternoon, that this is really about creating belonging and really finding ways to connect. And as a community health center person, we know that there are so many wraparound services that people come in and need, particularly in light of the pandemic, whether it's behavioral health, if people are experiencing homelessness, if there are challenges with transportation or access to health care, food insecurity, what are things that we can do when people are coming in that we can make sure we're connecting up with this? We never want people to feel like we've scooped them up with nets and brought them in and just given them the shot, but that we've really looked from a holistic approach of what can we do and how can we really respond. Um, as Lisa was talking about sort of the fervency of the planning and knowing that we've done over 50 vaccination events over the um, past you know, year and a half, it's like wedding planning true wedding planning, where you have some well-behaved brides and some not, but really a fervency of getting it done, but a celebration, because this is really all about 
bringing people together. And that thought about these vaccinations are really impacting future generations gives us kind of a leg up that it's no longer a requirement or something you have to do. But as we've changed our messaging and looked at, at it through an equity lens and a way to really connect and mobilize with the community, it was a personal responsibility of how can you really feel like you're making a difference in your community. Next slide, please. And many of you are, or all of you, I'm sure are very familiar with the social determinants of health. And I love this slide and thank you Kaiser Family Foundation for um, letting us use this all the time to say, who are our partners that should be there as well? Knowing that vulnerable populations are really impacted by these social determinants of health or lack of access to the services who are there. We use this as our roadmap to really figure out who we'd like to have one as a partner, two who needed to be on site, and then what were the needs of the community. So we, as we look at this, whether it's health access or working with a library around getting books into hands of multicultural children, figuring out ways to address safety the built environment and other types of things. But ultimately, this is about changing the healthcare system because now what we're doing is empowering and working with people. So they become not recipients of care, they become full partners and participants in their care. And as we look at this from a broader identification, and we said at the beginning, revolution and transformation, this is really about moving collectively forward with the community. And certainly finding ways to bring in diapers, finding ways to bring in toothbrushes, linking people up to affordable and accessible healthcare or health insurance, and taking this information and figuring out how it can be an engagement strategy and also a way to do warm referrals in the community, but a way to really make sure people never feel like it's a one and done. Thank you for coming. Who knows when we'll see you again, but really how are we beginning to build that relationship? Because once we start addressing the health equity, let's start looking at jobs. Let's start looking at moving the community forward with housing opportunities and other types of things that this is really, again, just the beginning of building this healthy community, starting at the individual grassroots level and really moving forward. Next slide. So when I look at these pictures here and each one of them, and I love the intent of having so much visual in this because each one of the photos on this one talks about one of the experiences that they have. And, and I'm just gonna share a couple of the ones that really stand out to me. And they're, I'm a, I'm a very sort of visual and kind of sensual person in the sense that one, a couple of months ago, we were at a methadone clinic. The sun was rising over the highway. We were outside at 4.30 in the morning. You could smell the coffee. The food truck had arrived with soul food. Cars were coming in. People were coming in with their children as they were coming to get their, their methadone. There was a man who was completely tatted up in the front crying. He had just received information that his dad had died in Las Vegas the night before of COVID. And he was completely hesitant about needles. Ironically, he was completely tatted with both sleeves done. And as we started to talk to him and through his tears, he said, well, I guess it's a message from my dad because he died and I should probably get the vaccine in his honor. He took his methadone and came over and he asked if one of us could hold his hand because of his fear of needles. And as he's sitting there and the environment of a parking lot with a little bit of trash blowing and people being there opened up the opportunity to engage, engage with him at a human level for the grief and the loss of suffering that he was experiencing from a family member dying that so many people have. The fact that he's trying hard to remain in recovery and then made a decision in honor of his father to become vaccinated. Those types of moments spread as we worked in mobile home parks on hot, dusty afternoons with Mexican ice cream being scooped in a food truck that smelled of fajitas and people getting winter coats, even though it was 90 degrees and kids running around. And a young boy who ran over, who was at a parochial school who wanted to run track, but he, his mom wouldn't let him get the vaccine. And he said, but I really wanna get it because I wanna be healthy for my track season. And his mom was a Spanish speaker and she came over and she was adamant that her son was not going to get this. And we sat down to have a conversation and it wasn't as if there was a magic wand or a way to convince her. It was a connection of woman to woman, of mom to mom, sitting on a picnic table in a mobile home park to listen to her concerns and bring in one of our volunteer physicians who was there to let her health concerns be there, but also find a way to 
make her feel that she was connecting with other mothers who were challenged by the same fear, knowing that there might be something that might go wrong, but then getting her answers answered, getting her questions answered in a place that she felt safe. Not only did she allow her son to get the vaccine, she herself became vaccinated and then brought family and friends to our next event. As we talk about these moments of bringing people together, whether it's at a, a middle school, whether it's at the basement of an African American barber shop, at the Long Chang Market, out in the community, we're always looking for ways to not only reduce the barriers, but engage with people and find that human impact and find a way to connect with one member of the community to continue to spread that. We recently had an opportunity to be out in a rural area at an elementary school where a number of people came off the farms and there's a woman who stays in my mind. She works on a goat farm and came in to get her vaccine because she's a single mom caring for two children with autism, four-year-olds. And she said, I got the text from partnership because you said there were gonna be diapers. And thinking about a mom living in a trailer on a goat farm with two incontinent four-year-olds who will be in diapers most likely for a good portion of their life. She left with her arms full of resources. And not that she was that was enough, but she felt that somebody understood her challenge and that she was able to connect and know that there was a resource there that she needed, that we could respond to, and we could connect with her as a human being. We look at this work so much beyond just, again, why didn't you go to Walgreens and get the shot? But to how do we begin to mobilize and heal as a community? When we kick off our vaccine at events, and they've moved from, from clinics to events to really now community engagement opportunities, we always huddle. We talk about the logistics and where the bathrooms are and what we need to do if there's a problem and who's doing the were entry and all of which is our um, registry in Wisconsin. All of those things, we thank our vaccinators, we re remind people that when people come in, we applaud, we thank, we welcome, and then we have a moment of inspiration or a moment of silence or something that gives us an opportunity to reflect on some of the darkest days we've seen as a community, as a nation, and then find ways to heal find ways to celebrate, find ways to find the possibilities. I leave you with this quote, and I find it's really one that has inspired us and really puts the umbrella over the work that we're doing. And, and really, I think, helps us move forward. Only when it's dark enough can you see the stars. And when Dr. King said that, the world was in, in a very different place, but in so many ways, very similar to where we are today. When we look at vaccine equity efforts, when we look at the logistics and then the power of the work and the fact that we have come from some darkest days, that if it hadn't been for this public health emergency, our coalition never would have begun. Lisa, Dr. Pam and I didn't know each other prior to this work, which is a fascinating thing because we go through each day wondering how we had ever lived without each other and all of the other groups. As we both worked in our circles and all of our, you know, zipping around, our paths had not crossed until there was a moment that we needed to come together as a community to begin to respond, to act, and now collectively move forward and heal. We leave you with this as thoughts. We know that the capacity around this table of the audience is, is huge as well. And many of you have done so much great work out there. We'd like to leave this opportunity for a little bit of question and answer that we could put into the chat or comments that people have. But on behalf of the multi Multicultural Coalition, myself, Lisa and Dr. Pam, thank you so much for the time to share our work. We look forward to coming back with series two and would welcome any other questions or ideas that you would have that you'd like for us to cover in the next session. And I'm sure that there's lots of sort of blueprint logistical things that we didn't share today because this was really about the framework and how the work is done before the work is done. So um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa, Dr. Pam, Trish. Um, that was great. So chock full of information. I know we didn't have a lot of time for questions. Um, I mentioned at the start and in the chat, uh, we'll keep the Zoom room open um, for a little while uh, until about 2.45 um, if folks are here and wanna chat. Uh, and we're also going to launch a poll momentarily. So before you drop off, if you wouldn't mind just completing that um, uh, for our events team uh, to help us improve, get better. Uh, we wanna know how you found this event. 
Um, and to kick off, so I had a question. I think this is actually a little bit more about the logistical, the second workshop. So I, it might lead into that a little bit, but I know that some federal um, awards or generally federal awards don't allow you to, there's a lot of restrictions on what you can spend um, that funding on. Uh, and so, um, you know, there's limits on kind of incentives, uh, food, entertainment. I don't know if you have like quick advice on places that your coalition has gone or used for uh, good sources to support those kinds of things that, um, you know, are really key to some of the events that you all have, have put on. I'll not, just give, <laughs> yeah. yeah, from from our experience, if there are things like that incentives food, um, we also ask for support from our community foundation, which has been extremely supportive and helpful. Mm -hmm. And from the beginning, we um, began our work with the United Way through the Community Solutions Team, and we've worked very closely with them through their diaper bank, through um, some of their food programs. Um, we also all, as organizations, hold different funds that have come in, both at state and the private and the foundation level, that allow for a little bit of flexibility with some of that, because certainly the, the incentives, there are definitely restrictions from federal dollars that come in. But um, we are always looking for opportunities to engage someone else so they can connect and, and provide these events with resources. If others have questions, feel free to speak them as well. Um, we're not a, a very large group, um, and so you can certainly just come off mute, speak your question. Um, I, I can't stay for uh... Uh, much time, but I, I do want to uh, illustrate something that uh, Trish said uh, at the very start. She said, uh, those closest to, to the problem are the uh, closest to the uh, 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 solution as well. And so I just wanted to, uh, what, a, what a beautiful framing. Um, you know, it's, uh, I, you know, truer words are, have, have never been, been spoken. It's oftentimes we think about, uh, you know, we, we have, you know, secondary data, or we we understand intellectually what a a problem is, and we come in with a bag of of uh, you know interventions, and uh, but oftentimes we we miss the mark if we're not getting the buy in from those that are uh, you know impacted. So um, I I love that framing, Trish, and I I'm I've written that down. I've got your your name next to that quote, and that's probably going to make it into a. PowerPoint slide at some point in my life. So um, just just to call that out. Well, and it's certainly not my <laughs> quote, but um, it's certainly something I believe. Thank you so much for the. And I just wanted to address, I saw a question, I think it was from Jade um, regarding partnerships that we have with vaccine administrators. Is that correct? Is Jade still on the call? Yes, I was I was just curious because sometimes it's hard to go back and reuse administrators from the points that you've made. So I was just wondering in your experience, are you trying a bunch of different ones or do you go back and have a you know group of people that work with you? Just just curious. You asked the million dollar question and I wish I had a million dollars, but um we we have a like a uh back pocket full of vaccinators, administrators that we work with from public to private health. And uh, for lack of a better term, I just keep cycling through and asking, trying to be fair and equitable in my ass. Now, having said that, there is um, one partner, I believe Ascension is nationwide as well, if that's correct. But Ascension has been a huge, huge partner with us um, in providing vaccinations, hugely supportive. But I try not to tap them too much. But to your question, I'm constantly challenged with finding vaccinators. We also work through the state and their contracted services as well. Jay, does that kind of answer your question? That was wonderful. It actually gave me some food for thought. So thank you. I appreciate that very much. Good. One thing I want to add to this that didn't come up on the um, presentation, and I didn't mention it, one of our newest partners in this work is the statewide Wisconsin Council of Churches. And I want to call them out because they came to us because they had a failed event at a church and first said, well, wow, nobody showed up. What happened? You know, we were all ready to go. The pastor was on board. Well, they had identified a church where everybody was probably over 65 and this was well into vaccination. 
And they wanted to bring in the community, but they hadn't really done their work. And as we started to talk to the vaccine equity group out of the Council of Churches, this just opened up another way to partner with, sure, we'd love to work with churches, but this was a coordinated effort at the state level where they actually had identified staff members who were doing vaccine equity work within the ecumenical community. And let me tell you, they have been fantastic to work with. So just another toss out for maybe another partner that maybe you haven't thought about or have opportunities. Individual churches are great, but knowing that there's support potentially statewide through a broader council may be a place for people to, to work. Thanks, Trish. That's good advice. Any other questions? Well, do you all want to, um, I can't tell if folks are staying because they have questions. <laughs> We're just taking a little while to um, depart. Do you want to preview a little bit about what's on the June 9th or what, what your thoughts are so far? Because um, I think probably some of these folks are signed up for that one too or thinking about it. So that might be a good way to wrap up. Um, I would say that it gets down into um the tactics and drills down into the method behind the madness um, from our planning process to execution and what that looks like. We have gotten to a point, if need be, we can set up for one of these community-led vaccination events in 30 minutes or less. Wow. And um, But again, that goes so, so much back to the planning and all the trust building that we talked about today. But the, this, the second workshop really gets into the, the planning tactics and how we roll through those and talking about how we roll through vaccinators and finding partners and making the calls for resources. So we'll get a lot more specific. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and to Lisa's point, I think I just wanna share with whoever's left here is that, you know, part of what we wanted to do was to, to help you realize that planning a vaccination clinic isn't I get up tomorrow morning and I'm going to put together a vaccination clinic and everyone's going to come. If you want to put together an effective vaccination event or a clinic for marginalized communities, it's a lot of work on the front end to just get them to understand your flyer or to look at your flyers. Um, and there's a lot of trust building that has to be done. And that's why we felt it was really important for us to share that piece, because that is the piece that I guarantee you in all the work that I've done in the community, that's the piece that gets missed all the time. It's kind of the concept of if we build it, they'll come. Um, and when you're working with the most marginalized communities who've historically been oppressed, there's a lot of distrust there. You can build all you want. They won't be coming unless you start to build relationships with them. And that's why it's so critical of what we are doing and why we wanted to do this first session in regards to that, and then to get into the nuts and bolts of those different pieces, because we can do all the planning we want, we can put together an elaborate event all we want, but if nobody shows up, how successful have we been um, with that? So that is a component that is really critical. And sometimes we put the cart before the horse because we feel like, you know, the need is so great. If we just do it, they'll all come. But there's so many other factors, so many other uh, challenges that we have to overcome before they even look at a flyer or they even tell anybody else about who we are and, and the work that we're doing and how those individuals should trust us and come. I'm curious how far ahead you all plan. I'm wondering, this is as a parent of two little kids who are not eligible for a vaccine yet, are you kind of planning ahead already to think about kind of family focused or sort of that young group focused? like ready to go as soon as the vaccine's approved for that age group? We're always yeah. talking about that, Bridget. Um, plus we we have been focusing on families and small kids, you know, for quite some time, but then taking it, um, we're always looking at, always talking about it, always looking at it. Mm -hmm. And then we also know that we have a little bit of leg time between when it's announced at the CDC level, then comes down to the state level. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and then it comes down to the comfort level of our vaccinator um friends right and oh, that's then, true yeah smaller it's a different it's a different group 
Yeah. yeah, it's a noisier group. And one of the things we found too, um, outside of the noise, is that there are so many kids coming through and parents and families with special health care needs. And we mm. really try to accommodate um, these vaccination events to really take into consideration, not only are kids scared of getting a shot, but there are kids that are coming in who have sensitivity needs or visual challenges or just sensory issues and how we did that. So early on, we purchased these weighted stuffed animals that could sit on their laps and we're developing um, various little flip charts to prep kids and really anybody because they're nonverbal, they're just little visuals of what's gonna happen. Um, what is the process so we can educate. And we have had a number of families come through with kids with autism who have needed that. And then anybody who is you know a little bit unsure about it loves the, the weighted stuffed animals, but just other things so we're really using a trauma-informed approach, but also beginning to understand some of these other challenges that families have, particularly in that school age group that um, we might not be aware of, but we have to plan for. Really key. And those seem like great ideas. I know it's a different group and there's definitely areas of expertise and sort of, yeah. that, you know, lots of providers. Or just having stickers ready. Um, <laughs> and you know really what? Parents. I mean, that's the, the biggest challenge, I think, is really helping parents get through that process as well. Mm -hmm. One other thing, Bridget, I was thinking about that, Trish and Dr. Prime, I think you'll remember this. I think it was Menasha, is we had a couple come and basically had been isolated from mm -hmm. the beginning of the pandemic. And they came to our event and they saw all the people and all the activities and they said, this is too much for us. Right. Mm -hmm. So it makes us take a step back and think through how do we accommodate um, that consideration for people have been isolated. Now we, we need to make adjustments and make sure that we're inclusive for all. So mm -hmm. we, we always have that safe space set up at the clinics now, but um, yeah, we have a lot of conversations about that too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's fine. I don't know that I would necessarily think of that, you know, first thing that in a sort of a group event that you should have a space like that, because people come out to the group event might feel more comfortable coming to a community event, um, but still not a crowded one, right? Versus right. going to their mm -hmm. clinic or, or another place. So. Yeah. And we do have like, you know, wherever we go, location is really important and how we can utilize the spaces there to give people privacy. People who are a little bit more more you know uh, guarded in terms mm -hmm. of interactions with other people and things like that we take that into consideration and if they request that we have spaces where they can go where they can just go get vaccinated and they can leave mm -hmm. um, so we we do take those things into consideration as well too mm -hmm. yeah more to come Are there any other workshop members that have, J oh, Jade, you just came off. Do you have a question? I, one more question, one more question. Yeah. Have you, uh, I'm just curious in your guys' experience, have you noticed that mobile vaccine clinics are being attended uh, more as opposed to those who, um, what would we call them? They're kind of like uh, churches or um, rec centers that have been dedicated as vaccine and site testing. Uh, have you seen that uh, people feel more comfortable going over one or the other? What's quicker than the other in uh, your experience? Well, I can say when we look at locations, so if, if I'm understanding your question, we try to save away from government buildings and entities even though we have access to that. And those are really the, the ones that say, well, you can use that at any time. We stay away from that because of um, the, we've heard from our community, this is part of listening to them, of the fears around that because of the raids that were done and around um, government buildings where people went there to get help with something. And then, you know, they were apprehended by ICE and all of that. So we know this, again goes back to the that audience that you are working with and being very intentional about their needs and what they perceive as safe and what they perceive as not safe and to really build that vaccination piece around that so when we do it um, we normally don't do it at a government building of some sort and we also don't do it 
unless we absolutely have to because our rural communities are so small, we try not to do it near a government building of any sort or kind. So we usually will use a church or some other places. And we found that more of the private places, um, people are more apt to come in if they are more familiar with those places because those have been safe places for them before that they they would come they would be more comfortable coming to that so it really every um, event is different depending on who we're targeting for that particular event in that particular area and all of our you know events are open to the public but when we do outreach and targeting we're very um, aware of the needs of that particular area and the thoughts um, of the people living there that we are trying to target and outreach to and invite and co-create safe space with. Mm -hmm. Was part of your question about mobile units, I, I might've missed a little bit of that. We haven't really done a lot with any sort of mobile um, groups coming in. We have, I think early on when we did something in Oshkosh, Dr. Pam, with the Hmong community, that it was from another health center that did it. But mm -hmm. we really like the full, the full kind of wedding planning with a location. So um, we can do many other wraparound services, not just have a kind of van pull up, but we really haven't explored that either and kind of done food truck slash mobile unit. I don't know. No, thank you for that. Um, we've kind of done both. So I was just curious. Mm -hmm. Um, again, it's just experience wise what you ladies have seen. Uh, we we do think that churches, at rec centers with the uh, Department of Health. So yeah. it, it just varies, like you said. So and, and site location, sometimes I tend to think just my own biases that um, if they're mobile or things that people can get to in and out the quickest, they will come to it um, as opposed to something that's going to, you know, be a line, they have to make an appointment. So we, we kind of gravitate to what's going to be uh, most efficient and quickest in that regard. So thank you, ladies, for that. Jade, yeah, where did, did you your work? Are you, what, what state are you in? Uh, well, my, oh, the organization I represent, they're a national organization. So we have like 14 states um, where subunits are doing activities, whether it's at the county level, city level, they all differ. But the, I've seen, a, a, they've all done some type of vaccine clinic by now, um, but they've all done something different to get people to come. And they, uh, the population of focus for us is to be African-American, Hispanic, and Native American. So they all, again, kind of approach it differently based on those populations, the points that you ladies made, for sure. Sure, well, we'd love to connect up with you and learn from some of your experiences as well. So uh, stay in touch. Sure, no, I'll be here, thank you. <laughs> you know, and along, I was gonna add, Jade, to funny enough, um, when, when we look at a location, we look at the historical trust building or relationship that that location and people running that location have with the communities that we're serving. So if we go into a church that historically does not have a relationship or trust with the communities we're serving, our numbers are not um, good. If you're looking at numbers or the number of people that uh, we're reaching, it's just, it's indicative. You can see that outcome. Now, having said that, if we, you talk about Dr. Pam, I was thinking the outlier is Menasha Public Library. Every time it's a smaller community, municipality, every time we have an event at that, um, at that space, at that library, we have great reception, great community, because, and it tells us we know um, the folks that work there have done an awesome job building trust within the communities that they serve. So that trust, in essence, um, building that they've done translates to us as well. And we don't take that lightly, but every time we have an event there and they, they asked us back to come in again because it's been so successful. Agreed. There are some places that are just amazing. So I absolutely agree with you in your statement. Yeah. 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 Jade, um, I don't know. I'm going to try to put it. Uh, I'll put uh, my email in here. So Use us as a resource, you know, if we can be helpful, if you want to bounce around any um, ideas, we're happy to help. 
Oh, thank you. I, I definitely will capture that. Thank you, ladies. I appreciate this. I'll definitely be for the logistics just to see if the, you know, again, all our experiences are coming out with some repeatable patterns, but this is yeah. very helpful. Good, good. Um, hi, I'm Cheryl Wendrick. I'm with MOTEP of Cleveland, and we've been doing vaccine promotion uh, for the last year. And I just want to emphasize again the need to partner with trusted community partners. Um, we serve probably the most underserved area of Cleveland um, in terms of African American communities, and that's our target um, area. But we have a vaccine clinic plan. There's a um, a village, if you will, 125 years old, located right in the hop. There's assisted living, independent living, adult daycare. There's a lot of services that are provided on that campus for residents in the area. And we're partnering, partnering with them for a what we're anticipating to be a major vaccine clinic because it is a very trusted community organization. And anytime we've done that, um, you know, again, I can't emphasize enough the need to partner with other organizations that are trusted in the community. Um, it gives you a great opening uh, to do what you need to do. And the other thing we utilize are vaccine navigators. They're trained. Um, it allows individuals that are hesitant about vaccination or have questions to sit down in a, a more a discreet area to discuss uh, the vaccines and concerns regarding vaccines. Um, so again, uh, partnering is key. Uh, it leads to great success. So I can't emphasize it enough. I agree with you ladies 100%. Joe, I yep. love what you're Thanks, saying Cheryl. about vaccine navigators. And I think that's something we, we don't call some of the you know, sort of trusted people in the community that, but I'd love to hear more about the work you're doing on that because it sounds a little bit more formal than what we're doing and having people actually identified as those research, kind of like community health workers or other ways to do that. So that that's a really exciting piece you have in place there. That's very good, thank you. Okay, any other questions or comments? We have the room for a few more minutes if we need to, but um, I know- One thing, yeah. you oh, know, I, I was just gonna add to Cheryl's comment about the um, vaccine navigators. I, I think that that's an area of opportunity for us to formalize that, formalize it, you know, but make it approachable. But then the other thing that we do is we partner with another nonprofit, CAP Services, and we provide their telephone information and um, people who speak multiple languages are answering the line and questions from their end too. We always make sure that that's available, but I'd like to approach that from the get-go when people are walking in or, because you can see the hesitancy as soon as they walk in, they look like they're ready to bolt. So how can we engage them more, you know, with our Dr. Shelby type people? All right. Well, I think we can close the workshop. Oh, Cheryl, were you going to? No, I just wanted to, again, yes. thank you all. Um, and I do get some good tips. I mean, just adding some of that information to the flyers, no ID required, no pre-registration, no medical insurance. That, you know, we haven't done that. And I think that would be very helpful. And I think we're going to, I'm going to recommend that we move ahead with that. And Cheryl, yeah. one of the pieces when we say, you know, no health insurance, we have um, through the our community health center, people who are on site who are actual navigators and certified application counselors. So people fill a little get to know you form and I will share that at the next session. So if they do have medical bills, questions about insurance, we never say, are you uninsured? But, you know, are you? You know, do you have questions? And and then we actually um, document that, follow back up with them. And what we have found, and we'll give you a little spoiler alert for the next session, is as we've looked with where our um, vaccine events have been held 
in those communities, within the communities of color, we looked at partnerships data and then found that as we've seen growth in our diverse populations, our new patients, both in primary medical, dental and behavioral health, as well as health and insurance enrollment have paralleled that. And that it's not, you know, this is not dissertation level data yet, but we're looking at this saying, there is a direct, because we're collecting this, we're following up, people are getting the coverage, getting the care. And that's again, part of this whole journey of, of, of powerful health equity, because it's not just saying, you know, go get a doctor, go, go be seen for your diabetes, but finding <laughs> ways to really connect with people and then have the data reflect that um, at a very preliminary level. I can't get too excited, but to then see that, but that no insurance piece allows people who currently don't have insurance or are not eligible for insurance to connect up with us and make sure that that's not a barrier for healthcare because in the middle of a pandemic, people need care. And we know people have been delaying. So that's been a really great place. So you might be able to do other things with that, um, no insurance necessary and find ways then to connect up and, and help people find um, equitable resources. You know, and actually this whole, uh, the whole pandemic, I mean, the good things come out of it. I totally agree because we're already now thinking about next steps in terms of mobile, screenings for, you know, the population high in diabetes and the hypertension mm -hmm. and, um, you know, and actually we're affiliated with a uh, nonprofit dialysis organization. So we treat a lot of these patients, but getting them screened and then getting them working with federally qualified health centers in the area to get yeah. these followed up on. So, I mean, we're already thinking about, we need to get out in the community more, get these people screened for other health conditions um, because it works. I mean, it has worked for the vaccinations and it can work for, for more with respect to just improving the, the health care of this population. So, you know, it's been very exciting, actually. Yeah, it is. Thank you, Love Cheryl, it. for that. And you just reminded me one other thing that we've uncovered um, that we're starting to partner more with the public health entities is the low immunization rates for children in all the other um, areas. And the school nurses, for example, are in a little bit of a panic of how do we get our children's immunization rates in all these other areas up before the new school year. So now we're, we're looking at how do we help support those efforts. Yeah. Awesome conversation. Thanks. Everybody. It is great. Thank you, Cheryl and yes. Jane, for sticking around and Cassandra. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank, thank you. Everybody. And thank you, facilitators. Thank you. We'll see you. We'll talk to you again thank very you. soon. I know Mary, I will. She had to, Mary had to go and pick up her kid. Um, so I'm going to close this out, but thanks all for staying on. Those of you who stayed on to ask more questions. Um, and thanks very much uh, to our Wisconsin team. So it was thank really you. helpful. I'm very excited about the checklist that's going to come out of this too. I realized too late that I should have mentioned that there would be this product that would kind of reflect a lot of what they're hearing, but I'll yeah. make sure to do it ahead of June 9th. So. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks all. Thanks good. for Thank staying you. late. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thanks for staying late too. Um, Bye. Bye. Bye.